Bang. Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of the Yacht Films Podcast. We have a very special talent with us tonight. He's a talented theater performer, but probably his most recognized roles come from Courage of the Cowardly Dog. He's played Cats, the Quack, Freaky Fred, the Snowman, Dr. Vindaloo, and many, many more I could go on forever. But, of course, I'm talking about Paul Scheffler. How are you, Paul? I'm good, guys. Thank you. Nice <laughs> to be here. And I am also joined by Tiki from So You Want to Be an Imagineer. Hi, Tiki. Hello. How are you guys doing tonight? Uh, Paul, very nice to meet you. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure. And then we also have Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Hello. Again, nice to have you on, Paul. Thank you. And then, of course, we're spe- expecting uh, Dragon sometime soon. Not yeah, sure we're expecting game. Blue Dragon 5. He should be on in the next 10 minutes or so, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> he's a very big fan of one character that Paul has voiced in particular. <laughs> <laughs> so just to tease it. Just to tease it. So well, let's just jump right into this. Um, so why don't you tell us how you got started in the business? Um, are you talking about specifically voiceovers? You didn't mean anime? Uh, theater, uh, where, where, you, where you started in your, your acting profession, your career. Oh, God. That, that's going back to 1890. <laughs> Before there was any sort of uh, media as we were used to. Um, I was uh, 20, and I was living out in California, and I was going to a two-year college uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I was throwing myself into everything, and the college I went to was also the college where Robin Williams went to college, and it's a great theater program, and so I tried that, and I I just fell in love with theater and kind of felt I was behind the curve, so I... Uh, applied to um, theater training schools and ended up going to Carnegie Mellon. I was desperately wanting to go to Juilliard, but it turned out to be kind of a blessing because um, Carnegie Mellon had a great musical theater program. And so I studied voice, I learned to sing and um, had a great time there and did a four year program in three and then ended up in New York in 1985. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, kind of struggled for three, four years, but gradually just kept at it and kept putting things together. And the way I got into voiceovers, uh, oddly, was I was doing an off-Broadway show, and a guy named Doug Keston came. He was a, an on-camera. He's an on-camera. He still does it, an on-camera uh, agent for Paradigm. And he said, hey, I think you'd be really great for uh, for uh, on-camera stuff. You want to come into the agency? And I said, yeah, sure. And I, I came in, and... Um, I had a beard at the time because I was doing the show that required it. And he said, would you be willing to shave your beard? And I said, yeah, of course. And I, I just, while I was there, I said to him, hey, you know, I think I could really do voiceovers. I said, okay, if I meet uh, your voiceover guy. He said, sure. And so he walked across the hall and introduced me to a guy named Jeb Bernstein, who was one of the best uh, agents in New York. And I sat down and talked to him, and he said, you got a great voice. I'm going to send you to someone for a little coaching to learn some tricks, and then I'll start sending you out for voiceovers. And I thought, yeah, okay, a lot of agents tell you that, but they don't actually do it. (laughs) And true to his word, he did. He started sending me out, and I was lucky enough within uh, a couple of weeks to book um, some radio commercials. And then I guess within about a month, I was lucky enough to – have booked uh, the Shell Oil account, and I did all. Actually, they did this animated campaign of dancing cars that went on for like three years, and I ended up doing all of that. And um, so, I, from that, I, I I don't even remember how. Actually, I just went in to audition for Cats for Courage the Cowardly Dog, and um, in the audition, I just looked at him and I thought, <clears throat> well, I wonder if it would be. Um, Kind of like James Mason, if you remember that old British actor who did um, a lot of great films. But he sort of talked like this. <laughs> Everything was very sort of, you know, drawn out and very sort of raspy. And that's how I did it. And that ended up being Cats because I guess John fell in love with the character. And um, and so I, when I came in and I met him, I just started goofing off in the studio and coming up with strange accents, which I do, and characters. And John was like, oh, my God, what else do you do? And came up with these <clears throat> different voices. And he said, I'd love you to read for uh, some other things. And so what he would do was hand me pictures of these characters. And he'd say, go away. And come back in a few days with some ideas for voices for these characters. And I said, okay. 
And I'd come back with as many as I could think of. And then we'd goof around in the studio uh, and they'd finally go, that, that's the voice, that's the voice we want. And that's how I ended up uh, starting to do these characters. And uh, wow. Wow. so it was, that's how it kind of all started. And John and I hit it off and, uh, and uh, he just kept throwing different things at me. And I ended up, I don't even remember how many characters I did. I mean, I did the opening credits of the, the news reporter and then with cats and then <clears throat> freaky Fred. And then I did a Sean Connery one day and that turned into the snowman character. And um, <clears throat> it started like this. And all of a sudden he started to, it ought to be a great character for a snowman. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how that came about. So I just kind of ran through everything I could think of. And it was great for me because I, I got to really find out what I could do and, and couldn't do. And, and um, uh, he was just great about it. And that's, that's sort of the long version of how I came to do Courage the Cowardly Dog. <laughs> So John wow. Dilworth uh, recently did an audio commentary on King Ramsey's Curse, and right at yeah. the beginning of it, he yeah. gives a very flattering credit, saying you're essentially the Mel Blanc of Courage the Cowardly Dog. Uh, well, my question but, is, how do you feel about that comparison? And also, oh, I, was I, I, Mel Blanc uh, kind of a big inspiration to you in terms of voice acting in general? I well, I mean, God, I mean, Mel Blanc is <laughs> Mel Blanc. I mean, nobody's Mel Blanc. Of I mean, course, yeah. Only kind of him to say, but I, I mean, there's no one else like Mel Blanc. I, I mean, really, that's that's ridiculous a comparison to make. But <laughs> I mean, I, he definitely, I definitely watching, came from a flattering place. <laughs> well, I, I grew up watching Mel Blanc, like I'm sure you guys did. Sure. All those cartoons, and just, are you kidding me? This guy. I mean, the versatility is just insane. And my kids grew up watching him and listening to all of that. And those characters and his his voice range and all the stuff he could do was just iconic. So, I mean, you know, even to be, you know, mentioned in the same sentence is flattering. <laughs> Let's be realistic, okay? Of course, of course. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But you know, John. John was just uh, great in giving me stuff to play with and come up with. And uh, I happened to be doing um, Peter uh, Hook on Broadway uh, with uh, at the time. So I would just come in sometimes ragged from from doing these shows <laughs> and 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 doing this kind of. I mean, if you guys you guys do you know animated stuff, it's very physical. I remember going into the studio and. And having to take a towel with me yeah. to the recording booth because it's so physical and you're trying to physicalize the characters that you're doing. And I would just come out drenched, drenched in, in sweat. Um, just, I just remember that experience. Uh, and, you know, I've talked to other voiceover guys. I was thinking about this the other day because you guys were asking me to come and do this. And I shared a dressing room with Wayne Knight. Oh, hmm. Yeah. Cool. Nice. 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 Oh, oh boy! The chicken Man in, in Toy Story Two, and of oh, course, he's extremely well known from from Seinfeld and tons of other stuff that he's done. And so I, I asked him, you know, having done all the Kurt stuff, and I'm always amazed at how they put everything together to make it look so seamless. And then Pixar, and that's like the ultimate seamless work when you watch what those guys do. And I said mm -hmm. to him. I said, did you guys get together in, in the booth to record stuff? Because it seems like you guys were just having this conversation with each other. I mean, everything seemed so well put together. He said, no, not never. I never met anybody else when we were doing stuff. I said, are you kidding me? Because it just when you watch it, it looks so well put together. You just assume that there were three or four people together riffing off each other in, uh -huh. the, in the booth. And no, they actually just did. They had so clear an idea, I guess, of what they wanted and managed to put it together and edit it together so seamlessly that when you watch it, you have no idea. So that was kind of amazing for me to learn that. That's actually kind of, yeah. that's actually kind of related to one of my questions. Did you record with other people when you did Courage? Never. Never, ever, ever. Huh. And that's why I asked Wayne. I said, because I never did. And other sure. people I talked to who've done animated stuff almost never. So I spent hours, hours editing stuff to make it seamless. So <laughs> I, I definitely know what you mean. Uh, you know, sweating in the booth, bringing a towel with you. I'm making a short film of my own, actually, with Jacob here. 
And yeah. I, I record all my lines and everything in this little closet I'm sitting in here. <laughs> and I, I have to like, you go take a shower afterwards because I, I am just like, oh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, it's also that pressure of, of they have a very clear idea most of the time of what they want. Oh, yeah. And so you're really trying to get it right for them. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, you're telling us. I mean, like, I do doing my work for him. Like, there's like some of these stuff have to be just right. <laughs> just right. They know what they want, and, and, and they're just saying, no, a little bit more. I mean, I'll tell you one funny story about John. I, I one of the characters were, were the two dead uh, zombie guys. I can't remember the name of the episode. But... I think Taren Tella and Errol Von Goldklein from, er, Von Goldklein from everyone that wants to do so, so I came, I can't also do this character who is dead. And they kept saying, no, you don't have <laughs> You don't sound dead enough. You're not so dead enough. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> you sound more dead. So I I came out of that. I, I I think I just absolutely shattered my vocal cords that day, trying to sound as dead as I possibly could, and I couldn't speak for like two days. Oh, it, <laughs> that is like the Tasmanian devil or something. <laughs> Now I was watching that. I was watching that episode recently, and um, I I noticed I could, I could understand uh, the other guys' lines perfectly, but yours they're they're super hard to make out just because you know you're 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 doing that whole uh, the dead thing you were talking about, and then you have some kind of accent mixed in there, and it's like I was over dead, <laughs> the German over dead guy or something. I don't know. <laughs> I think they went a little bit overkill on on the whole process there. I do remember being in the booth going, oh my God, what am I going to do? I can't, I'm not dead enough. How do I sound more dead? And <laughs> Did you ever get any other weird instructions for any of these characters? Say again? Did you ever get any other weird instructions like that? Um, yeah, I'm sure I got a lot of them, but I'll tell you another. This, is, this happened more than a few times when uh, I went in and they were trying to nail down the voice of a character that I would start with an idea and they would go, no, 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 that's not quite right. And so I, I, they'd say, try it a little more like this. And then, man, yeah, so try going this direction. And so this sometimes would take 20 minutes to 25 minutes. And then it would kind of come full circle to what I started with. And they'd go, yeah, that's it. That's the guy. But I would, <laughs> that's what I started with. So, I you mean, know, it's so, it's such an imperfect thing. But I guess they, you, you, I mean, you guys you know when you hear something to your ear, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. And you have a picture of it in your mind, I guess. And, uh, or I don't know, sometimes you're surprised by something and maybe that sparks you to go, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. And I, it's probably the same when you're trying to find exactly the voice you're looking for for a character. Um, I, I don't know. It's such a, it's such a crazy process um, that you have to discover in the process of doing it. <clears throat> So it's odd kind of because when you're doing voiceovers, I mean, if I if I book a voiceover for something, usually you, your job is ninety percent done because when you walk in, you're just trying to replicate what you did, and they just want you to sound exactly like you sounded in the audition. But for right. animated stuff, they hear something that they like, unless you, of course, absolutely nail it. But they go, "That's kind of what we want," and then. You go in and, and you have to fudge what it is that you're doing to, to manipulate it in some way to get them to get them to sign off on exactly what it is they want. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. And then that kind of leaks into this other question I have about fog of courage and you doing the computer in that in that um, in that short. What was that like? Did you, I know? I'm sure you got you and John weren't you know uh, to, like together doing that in the booth. That uh, I, I I'm I'm stumbling my words here, but how, how did you do that? God, I don't I don't really remember this this episode. Um, because the guy who played, are you talking about the 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 computer who kept reappearing that that courage would go and type onto? Well, I, I'm talking about the fog of courage, the 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 new CG short John did just a couple of years ago. Oh, God, you're not blanking on that. I'm no help to you at all. Sorry, I can't <laughs> remember. Um. Oh, you! My brain. I can't remember anything anymore. See, this is what happens when you get old, guys. So, um, <laughs> I'm blanking entirely. I, I, I can't help you. <laughs> that's that's all right. That's all right. 
Um, so did you volunteer to do more than one voice, or were you asked to to, to um to voice other characters besides cats? Um, I I said I was interested in anything, and then he just loved the stuff that I was goofing around with. And this, I just because because when I started playing around, he said, "Oh yeah, do more of that, do more of that." And so I started playing around with voices, and he said, "Oh my god, oh my god, you give me an idea for a character. Oh, we have this other character." And so that's just how it started. It just snowballed from me just goofing around in the studio and him asking me to, there were a couple of times when he gave me stuff, only a couple of times when I couldn't come up with a voice for it. Um, but I, I ended up doing, uh, I think around 12 or 14 different characters for the show. Um, but uh, that's, John just loved what I was doing. I loved my voice and he liked my crazy sense of humor and my kind of insanity in the booth that I would try anything, and um, Peter, our producer, he's gone now, God rest his soul, but he came from, he was Speed Racer, if you remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And uh, so he was very knowledgeable about, and he was actually really demanding about uh, what it was that he wanted, and, and extremely critical. You know, if he didn't like something that you were doing, he'd say, "No, you just don't sound this enough," or "You no, you just don't sound like you're involved with that," or "No, that doesn't sound committed." And or, he, did voices, he did voices too, right? Oh yeah, he did voices. Actually, he did. Okay. He was, I think, he was the other dead guy. Yeah, he was uh, Benton. Yeah, the other zombie. He, he's very, very good, um, and also very specific about what he wanted from you. Um, so he was a bit of a, a taskmaster as a producer. And so there was a lot of pressure. Yeah, P Peter Fernan Fernandez. That's right, Peter Fernandez. Yes. All right. I thought he was just a voice actor. So this is, this is news to me hearing. He no, was he was the producer. The studio forever. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's exciting. <laughs> I never knew that. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, he would give us direction, and you know they <laughs> they 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 mute you so they could have conversations about what you were doing <laughs> and what they and. Um, <laughs> Or loved or whatever, uh, but he was uh, yeah he was uh, he was a great guy, but he would be very specific with you about what he wanted. So maybe I'm just blanking here, and you already said this, but what was it like knowing you you got this role at least you knowing this you got the role of cats and going in there and doing this this first episode and then seeing it seeing this character animated to your voice on television like that. It's. it's God, it's it's uh, it was a little surreal. It was really fun. I, re I mean, I really love doing it, and, and so, yeah. and then my for my kids to watch it too, you know, and it's all over Netflix oh, yeah. right now. They just they love it, and I, I think they you know they love La Quack the most, and then they really like Freaky Fred, whom I, I oh, yeah. wish I had more opportunities to do Freaky Fred is. That character. I mean, this part of the thing of the show. That was a dark episode. <laughs> it was. It was pretty intense. <laughs> it was dark. Here, what's going on with all of this? And uh, <laughs> you can say that episode was naughty. Yes, and be, to be very naughty. You know, um, whatever that <laughs> meant. Um, <laughs> sort of dark, imaginative stuff, and that's kind of John. Yeah, he, he was. He was saying how. Oh, all this, um, how the episode came from his love of Dr. Seuss and he wanted to do something Dr. Seuss. <laughs> but then he just gave it his own twist on it. And, I did not uh, know Is that, that really. That's where he, he got his inspiration from because I he never told yeah. Apparently at least the rhyming structure of the episode, yeah. Yeah, and then he gave it to one of his writers and they, they helped him uh, write it. And I, I, I guess he'll have to, you know, ask him about the details or anything. Like, well, uh, if you, you really, I mean, if you want to get a, a taste of, of John's humor, I'm sure you guys have all seen the Dirty Birdie. Yes. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, that's where he's coming from. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sandy, do you want to quickly introduce uh, Dragon here? Yes. Yeah, so uh, joined with us here is Blue Dragon Five. Hi, Dragon. Howdy, howdy. How's everyone doing? Doing yeah, well. Doing well. So uh, um, we didn't start too long ago, so you're not you're not missing a whole lot. Um, oh, thank goodness. I'm so sorry for my uh, my, my delayed appearance here. Hello, Mr. Oh, Mr. Scheffler. How are you doing? Hi. hi. Mm. Now, Dragon, I tease that you're a big fan of one character that uh, Mr. Scheffler has voiced in Courage in particular. What would that character be? Well, Mr. Scheffler, uh, you see, one of my absolutely favorite uh, kind of 
courage villains, and not everyone's gonna point at cats or Lequack, but my character, oh, the one I, I, I go crazy for, Snowman. I love Snowman. Oh, Snowman, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> specifically, I just want to give you props for this while I have the opportunity. I just want to say one of my absolute favorite Courage Cowardly Dog episodes, and one of my favorite, just uh, I love the second appearance of the Snowman, a Snowman's Revenge. And I just love the, uh, I love the kind of the heart you gave to him there. It's, it's such a wonderful episode. You know, he gets his snow friends back. It's such, it's such a heart. That's such a heartwarming, melting, no pun intended episode. <laughs> I mean, it's basically a monologue, almost entirely a monologue. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was John. I just I was doing some impersonations in the booth, and John said, "Oh my God, we should do a character for that." <laughs> did a snowman that sounded like Sean Connery. I went, "Okay." Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what happened. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> But yes, those are fun characters to do. I have a question for you guys. You know, we were talking about about um, how you, you go into the booth by yourself and you record all this stuff, and then they patch it together to make it seem like conversations with other characters. And I, I was a, I'm a sort of a big fan of Archer, and oh, I I listened to. I mean, they kind of got a little crazy, like episode four and five got a little out there. But the first ones were just so wrong, and they were and. and <laughs> In, in a right way, but they sound like they're all together. I, I mean, when we were talking about how seamless a lot of the Pixar stuff was, when I was watching Archer, of course, having done this, I went, are these guys all together? Because they sure, I mean, that stuff is just riffing off each other. And I wonder if they actually got together to do stuff in the booth. I, I well, <laughs> they do a lot of live stuff, so that's definitely where rapport would come from. I, I could maybe extrapolate that's kind of how they do because, you know, sometimes it, it shifts between, you know, people are in the booths together sometimes. Uh, they, mm. Like Batman Animated Series, they like a lot of, like, pretty much what Archer did live is that they have, like, these stands that are up with the, with the pages and they kind of read, they read them off together. Mm -hmm. like, like okay. Maybe, like, a little separator in between them. I gotcha. <clears throat> yeah, because they, like they have a relationship going on all of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they, they do that for some TV shows. I don't know how, how 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 rare that is, but I know they did that for a show back in the '90s called Angry Beavers, and that was one of the first shows they shows they did it on. Where they just yeah, they had basically just all the characters, or at least the two the, the two main characters in the booth, right. just going back off each other. Huh. Yeah, they did that for uh, Cat Dog as well. Like uh, with uh, Jim Cummings and uh, Tom Kenny, they they read, they kind of played off of each other a lot when they did their recordings. Yeah. One mm. one current show I know for sure does that. It's a big part of the way they write and everything. Uh, and use the improv is Rick and Morty. Uh, Dan. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, Dan Harmon and Justin Rowland just uh, basically just bounce off and improv off each other, and that kind of forms. You know, <laughs> they have a little bit of a skeleton of a script, but their improv kind of makes up the whole. <clears throat> yeah. So, so that is very much a collaborative uh, voice acting show in that case. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. So do you have any other like, kind of uh, fun stories or memories from just uh, recording sessions? Um, <clears throat> well, or maybe, maybe, maybe something behind the scenes with John? Well, there was that time we all got naked and got drunk. No, not, that's not the <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, no, John. John is John is just John's just constantly unpredictable. His imagination is so out there that sometimes when you're talking to him, you have to kind of shift to another place because he's so unusual and so different that and and you have to get his sense of humor. And I think he likes people exactly. who, who like that. And. Uh, and I, I just click with him that way. No, I don't really have any crazy stories other than just remembering the fun times we had and laughing about stuff. And sometimes they would come up. I mean, you're talking about improving stuff, and I do remember there were some times where we'd, I would just improv things, and and they would go, oh, that's great, let's do that, and they would add that to the script. Um, but you know, most of it, it was hard work, fun. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're on, yeah. they're in the gun, and you got to get it done in a certain amount of time, and and so you want to give them what they want. So you end up being very trying to be this paradoxical thing of very focused, and serious about what you're doing, and very playful at the same time. Because <laughs> um, uh, you've got to be crazy. You got to go in there and act crazy, and and um, and be dead when you're playing dead characters, and. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so, I, but specifically, no, I can't remember anything off the top of my head 
So this, this this might be a little a little much to ask of you just right off the top, but what would what what would Katz's opinion be of John Dilworth? <laughs> well, he's certainly not smooth. He's not, you know. I wouldn't say he's sophisticated like I am. <laughs> he's always in a hurry. He's got so much energy, but I don't. I take my time and have a martini. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have something, Dragon? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so, well, are there any uh, any lines in particular that kind of you, you remember, like made you do the most takes on? Like, oh my god, like, they're so funny. You said like to do how many times you get through it? Yeah, we were just talking about the one where I had to play this dead character, the the two zombie guys, and and they were telling me I wasn't dead enough. Um, so <laughs> I, I I basically shattered my vocal cords for about an hour and a half trying to sound dead. And uh, that was that was a stressful day. I really remember that. And I just I, I don't think I, I was having to sing on, on Broadway at the time and just oh. having to go and sing after my chords were just it's just like getting sandpaper and rubbing it together. So my my, my chords felt like raw meat. And, 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 um, and it's funny because the character the character doesn't have a whole lot of lines to so just exactly. like all that. All that pain. I know, and they kept saying, oh, "You're not dead enough." No, nope, not quite dead. Not oh quite God! Dead. <laughs> you know, no, nope, not quite dead. Nope. Just a flesh wound. Just a flesh wound. Yeah. <laughs> let me just let me just gargle some cyanide, then I'll try it again. <laughs> what is exactly? Let me go just swallow some vinegar and and gargle <laughs> that. And, uh, now, did, now, did your singing on Broadway help you do the Goose God? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm a singer. I'm a trained singer. So, well, that was funny, too. They just, well, actually, here's a funny story. They they said uh, for the Goose God, um, can you um, make up a song? Oh, you want me to do what? Task. Here's Here's the lyrics. Can you make up a song to this? And I went, uh, okay. And, and so that, I just came up with that. And from that simple Silly song that I did. I had to join the the, the musicians' union. Oh God! Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sing something, and you've created a song, however silly it might be, and all of a sudden you have to. You're part of a union, and so that's how that happened. <laughs> so yeah, I, I I did um, I do sing, and that did help. Yes. Because that's a, that's, a, that's personally one of my that's one of my favorite one-off characters. <laughs> yeah, it, it was yeah, it was very silly. It was really fun. Let me. Let me ask you this. Did you ever voice more than three characters in one episode? Uh, no, not to my memory. No. <clears throat> no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, uh, oh, no, I think I'd come in and do one at a time. Dr. Vindaloo or <clears throat> Katz or LaCroix or Fred or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then how, how did you, you were working on Courage, and then you're also, you said you're also doing Broadway. How did you uh, just like balance all that? Like, would you, what would you want during the day, one this day, one the next day? Or? Yeah, you just have to be careful with your voice, um, especially because I was, what I was doing was so vocally demanding on Broadway that I, I your voice, <clears throat> when your voice gets really tired, you, you have to be careful that you don't get to a point where you can't do it. And so I just remember basically not talking when I wasn't singing or doing, you know, the show on Broadway. And, and usually I'd have a day off or two before having to do the animated stuff. But there was a period there for almost two years where I was in like every third day. Um, and it also depended on what the character was. Like doing cats was no big deal. It wasn't vocally exhausting, but there were other things that were. And you'd have to be in there for a couple of hours doing crazy things with your voice and then have to go and sing at night. And those, there were, I remember there were some, some hard days where you were just pushing through it. And it's not a nice feeling because <clears throat> um, you just feel tired vocally. And, um, yeah. But uh, you're also really grateful for doing it. I mean, I had to do – it was also – Doing this, and then I, 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 it was one of those strange times when there's just a lot of work coming your way because I was doing um, stuff for NBC Sports. I was the golf announcer for NBC uh, for a year there too. So I would often finish the show at 10:30 and then have to go to Rockefeller Center to do promos for NBC Golf. 
<clears throat> you know, like the 99th U.S. Open is brought to you by Titleist, the longest ball in golf and shit like that. <laughs> uh, so, there, there, and I, I, I knew at the time, I was saying to myself, this, this isn't going to happen forever, so enjoy it. Because for all the times that you're lucky enough to be working, there are times when you're not. And so, uh, you say thank you. And just do your damnedest to, to do the best you can. <clears throat> And you're doing Broadway now, correct? That's what you're currently doing. Uh, no, I just came back. I, I no, I finished doing uh, um, um, Rock of Ages uh, about a year and a half ago because I, I was playing a German character in that show. I did that show for six years on Broadway. But wow! wow. That, yeah, and I left to do. They, they were great. It was great because I'd leave to do other work. They, you know, they'd let me go do concerts. Let me go to do other shows and. Because you're an actor, if you do one thing for a long time, your brain starts to atrophy, and all your other muscles tend to get flabby. Um, and so you, and, and I mean that vocally, and your head, and all the, you know, because you're, you're you're constantly having to create in your head and use your body and your voice to create things. And so, if you get stuck doing one thing, it can kind of deaden you. So, uh, you're, I was lucky enough to be able to go and do other things while I was doing that show. Um, <clears throat> But I've just got back from doing a show in Philadelphia. Okay. I'm starting next Tuesday um, rehearsals for an off-Broadway play where I play the devil. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of Euro trash. I was doing, um, you know, Emile de Beck, who is a French person in, uh, this, in South Pacific, which I'm sure you know. And uh, I was German. I actually, I, for every show I've ever, I've been lucky enough to do on Broadway, I was, I was always someone foreign and always someone from a different country. <laughs> so um, whatever that means. So I apparently can't be myself. I have to be someone else entirely. Uh, <laughs> British, German, Italian, French. Yeah. So, and, um, so yeah. So I'm lucky enough to keep working. I'm very grateful. It. And uh, you know, there's times when I don't, but uh, fortunately, it hasn't been those periods of time haven't been very long. So, knock on wood, I'm still here and 200 years old and still doing it. <laughs> um, uh, and then, um, this is a fan question from someone on John's page. Um, they ask, What characters and courage felt the most and least natural for you to play? I'm guessing what they mean is like, what. I guess what my interpretation of the question would be, what character is most like you? Ha <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Um, uh, gosh. Probably. <laughs> yeah, let me think about that for a second. Um, well, not the dead guy. I can say that straight. <laughs> it's okay. You can admit it's Dr. Vindaloo, isn't it? <laughs> Dr. Vindaloo. Well, actually, he was tricky because, but you know, you when you're doing an accent, you find the cadence of what you're doing. But you have to make a, a character out of it on top of that. Sometimes it's just not so easy. Um, so Vindaloo was a little tricky. I I fell right into La Quack. Um, <laughs> I I just had so much fun with that, and it felt so right. And I remember that was just fun and easy, and everything kind of clicked. Cat was the same way. So I mean, to answer the question, which was most like me? Boy, I, I just have to say there's little bits of me in all of it. There wasn't one character that, because um, I'm kind of this way around my house. So can you imagine my poor children? <laughs> uh, poor souls. I, I walk into the room and I'm like, I'm, I'm the quack or I'm oh God. red and they're like, what are you doing, dad? Um, so, <laughs> so I would say there's a little bit of me in all of them. But I mean, if I was going to come from the point of view of what was easiest to do, I would say cats and the quack. Okay. And I actually have this question from the live chat. So somebody started us asking, what's the most effective way to train one's voice to get a better range of voices? More like practice, obviously, but more maybe more specifically. Hmm. <clears throat> well, I would say here's a. Well, hmm, it's an Some people. Uh, the voiceover people who do this stuff, they just have amazing voices and amazing facility. I would say the two things to train your voice is just to sing. Um, you know, I, that that's given me great flexibility to be able to do stuff really high and really low. Um, 
So I, 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 I don't think I would have had the range had I not trained myself to sing. Because you're doing vocal exercises to stretch your voice, low and high. And so you're learning to do all kinds of different things that you, you didn't think you could do. I would say the other thing, how to train is just, the, the best advice that <clears throat> was given to me about voiceover work came from one of my agents who just said, watch television, listen to commercials, listen to someone who might have the kind of voice that you have. Same thing with cartoons, animated stuff. What voices sound like you? And then just start playing, try to copy it. I, I guess, you know, uh, uh, copying something is the highest form of flattery with what we do. <clears throat> so I would listen to animated things and try to copy what I heard, not Mel Blanc, because nobody can do what Mel Blanc does, but <laughs> just, if you hear something, you know, try to copy it. I would listen to commercials all the time and go, you know, I think, I could do car commercials because it sounds a little upscale and my voice sounds a little upscale according to my agent. So I get sent out a lot for sophisticated stuff. Nice. Um, and, but I, I try to also copy things to see, you know, what I, 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 I could stretch myself to do. Um, so I would say that's the best thing to do. Just play, play vocally. And then would that be, would, would, I guess the same rules would apply for female voice acting too then, right? Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, <clears throat> I have a couple of friends, I, I have a friend, a, a girl named Josie Roberts, and she's done animated work, but her voice is amazing. You just listen to her and you go, oh, that's a character voice. That's a voice that you would hear on a cartoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, she's great. Uh, but there are certain people, you listen to them and they have such a unique vocal quality it doesn't sound like anybody else, and you, you go, wow, well, there's the reason why that person does animated stuff or they do voiceovers, um, because there's a quality about them which is quite remarkable. Uh, but you can train what yourself. What qualities do you look for in a director? What, what? What qualities do you look for in a, in a director of any variety? Do you, do you, is any of the theater? Uh, well, I like, a, I like a director who comes in with a vision. I like with a director who comes in having done a lot of homework. <clears throat> I have a lot, I love a director who says to me, "I want you to play. I want you not to be afraid to make big choices. Go big and let me bring it back. Because if you start small, I don't know what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. So be bold, take risks, fail, and trust me to lead you in a direction. That I love. You don't hear that very often." Um, hmm. uh, I, but I, I like directors who come in and have a really, really strong vision for what they want and can communicate it. Because not all directors can. A lot. Of, I've worked with a lot of directors, and a lot of directors are not actor directors. The directors who come in who have a great visual sense for something, and you're left to have to direct yourself. And we have a you know saying in theater is learn to direct yourself you know in french they say sauve qui peut which is save yourself because <laughs> sometimes you find yourself <laughs> and you're like ah shit, the director's not going to give me a damn thing so i better learn to figure out how to make this work for myself and save my ass because a lot of times you find yourself in that situation believe it or not and then other and, and when you come across a director who really knows how to speak actor speak you're like oh God, because <laughs> you'd be amazed how often that doesn't happen. And a lot of times, directors who are really good are, are former actors, um, and they know how to communicate with actors to get what they want. And a lot of directors will blame actors for not being able to create the vision that they want. But uh, it's, it's, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. My fault. <laughs> <laughs> actors only as good as their director. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such an imperfect process. Uh, I, I said to, I was talking to somebody doing Rock of Ages because it it's such a it took such a bumpy road to get there, and a lot of things had to fall into place. A lot of things have to fall into place that it's almost a miracle that it happens at all. Because <laughs> you have to have the right cast, you have to have the right director, you have to have the right communications department that know how to sell your product. You have to have um, great producers who understand how to support everybody. You have to have money people on board who are not 
invested to the point where they have to stick their hands in the pot and mess with it because they're investors. You know what I mean? All of those things have to come together in a way that when you think about it, it's just remarkable that anything gets done at all uh, for my man, at, at least on Broadway, because the risks are so huge. And maybe even for, for doing animated series and films, so there's so much at stake and, um, and there's so much money invested. And, uh, you know, you want to get it right. <clears throat> I guess that's why you hear on films sometimes that, that like on, um, I was just thinking about uh, Lord of the Rings when, you know, Viggo Mortensen wasn't their original choice for right. that character. And they they were looking at the dailies and thought this isn't going to, I can't remember who the actor was, but they were looking at the dailies going, this isn't, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work. And so they were scrambling to have to recast the film. And so imagine, you know, you got that kind of money involved and, <clears throat> you know, it can make or break a film. Yeah. Um, so. And then I, I guess, I guess, working with John Dilworth, I know he probably had a really strong vision going into Courage. I'm sure he was able to communicate his visions correctly, even even if he had to tune into different mindset to understand them, right? <laughs> I think so, but I guess there's sometimes uh, a symbiosis that takes place because he has got very. You, you know his stuff when you see it. Yeah. And I didn't know that when I started to work. I was just goofing around, but he heard something in my voice and in the things that I was doing that he knew would work with the kind of visual stuff that he was doing. But he couldn't have told us that when we got together. It just turned out to, to have worked out that way, um, which isn't always the case. <clears throat> you know, some people hear your voice and go, yeah, hey, that's not doesn't fit my vision of something but with John and I it just kind of did and, and now the all this would take place in New York right the the, yep. the studio the voice acting so yep. you were in New York at the time yep yep right in Midtown okay yep. and then he directed wow he directed he directed every uh, every episode he was so, very, very very hands-on John very hands-on yeah. and John's very he wears his emotions on his sleeve so if he didn't like something, you knew it immediately. You could watch his body language and go, well, John does not like what I'm doing. <laughs> come up with some other shit because he doesn't like it. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, but that's that's John. You know, he, he's kind of, he's a kid in, in a way. Uh, I've just, uh, I mean, a lot of, uh, of us who do what we do are kind of like kids who have not quite grown up. <clears throat> a child in a grown man's body? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, my, my kids all the time say, "You just, Dad, you seem like a kid." And I'm like, "Well, I, I'm, I dress up, and <laughs> <laughs> I am I'm a kid. I'm pretending to make a living. You know, it's crazy. I, it's like, <clears throat> it's like this quote I once heard: "What's the point of growing up if you can't act childish sometimes?" Exactly. Oh, it's so. like the world is big, pretty much. It's yeah. like the world is big. And uh, that's that's one of the reasons why I, I really admire people like John. And another person I really admire is Dick Van Dyke because yeah. he always says that, you know, he's well, he's like in his late 80s, early 90s. And, he, you know, he's, he's still dancing around at the supermarket. He's still singing songs and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. He says he's, you know, he's an old guy, and but he feels like a 15-year-old. So it's the kind of mindset. It's it, it makes you really likable, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I heard him interviewed, and he just sounds like a happy, happy guy. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I say this to my wife a lot uh, because I go through ups and downs, and, and, and God, life is hard for all of us for different reasons. And if you live long enough, shit happens to you and to your friends. And I know so many horrible things that are happening for a lot of friends right now and health-wise, and I'm in my 50s, and so – but I, I – and I get affected by it because I, 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 I'm a very sensitive guy, but I can't lose my sense of humor. And uh, I, I say to my wife, please don't let me lose my sense of humor <laughs> because it's, it's a way to help us cope, I think, with, uh, yeah. with life. So uh, craziness and fun and joy is, is what connects us to one another and uh, a sense of being playful and child. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer. I talk to students a lot. I, I do teach. And I, 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 most of us who do what we do we deal with rejection most of the time. 
yeah. So how do you how do you square dealing with that over a lifetime, and not have your soul, your sense of joy affected oh, yeah. by that? It takes a really strong sense of yourself. You have to have this really thick skin, but at the same time, you have to protect that childish, playful, joyful thing that made you want to do it in the first place. Yeah, makes and, sense. That's one and, reason. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I no, no, right. really. That's that's what I wanted to say. And so that that's an ongoing, lifelong kind of practice. That I I very clear about that. And sometimes I lose touch with it, but I I can't ever lose my sense of play. So that's oh. one reason why I really want to get into this job, like animation, voice acting, or any any anything like that, is to help people give that brief escape that they need. Well, yeah. My my voiceover agent said. Both of them always say to me, and, and, and I forget this sometimes, they said, just play. When you go into audition for stuff, don't overthink it. Just go with an idea, go with an impulse, just trust that. I mean, of course, you have to bring a set of skills and know some tricks and, and so forth. But if you get too thinky about stuff, especially with voiceover stuff, the microphone picks up everything. And you're trying to just bring life to it, and, and your life comes from your, from your sense of spontaneity and your sense of fun. <clears throat> and so I, I, I sometimes forget that, but that's the place you need to come from, um, I think, if you're going to do voice work, if, especially if you're doing animated work. And in a way, it's easier to do animated work because you're just being invited to be crazy and to get an idea of something and, and act it out. Um, so. Yeah, it comes from a place of, of just playful creativity. And I've, wor I've, I've done voiceover auditions with other voice, I mean, amazing, amazing voiceover actors who, who change the script, who come up with ideas to do things. I'm like, really? You're, you're changing the script? Okay. Uh, wow. Okay. And so I've learned from some of these guys that they, they're, they're trying to fit it to who they are. In the hope that that uh, by bringing as much life to it, that's going to make it work for their it's client. A, so it's like to the point where the character where they become the characters and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yep. I get I I personally get too thinky sometimes. I, I I'm very analytical in one way, and and I, I sometimes you have to let that go when you go in to do this stuff. You have to have impulses and listen to them, go with it. And, and that's how it works. But you know, you never get any feedback, <clears throat> by the way, <clears throat> when you go in to do voiceover auditions. You have no idea. <laughs> well, it must be the worst. <laughs> oh. Just uh, yeah, it's like playing to a brick wall. Of, like, it, it really is. How do I do? It's really weird because if I go into audition for a play or a musical, I, I pretty much I, I have a really good idea of how well I did, and I'll often get feedback from the casting people saying. Paul was great, but he was <clears throat> a little too much of this. And so you get an idea, you know, that at least give you feedback. And often when you go back, if you have to um, um, have a call back for something, they'll say, we loved Paul in the first audition, but the next audition we want him to be more like this. Can he lean more in this direction? So you're at least getting an idea of what they're hearing, and but in voiceovers you don't get anything like that at all. I mean, you think, either you, right, or you think, it's not going to happen. You think they would? I mean, you think they'd try something like that? I mean, well, you would. Uh, I, 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 I just had uh, the, the the girl that I played opposite of in South Pacific and uh, in, in Philadelphia is brilliant, brilliant actress, who personally I think should be much well more more well known than she is and she said and I was talking to her about this one day and she said you know part of the thing is that no director ever gives me direction in an audition and I'm really good at giving at, at changing directions if somebody will give me something specific but a lot of times directors if they see something that they, they have an impulse they go no nah, that's not right and instead of yeah well she's kind of right but maybe if we gave her some direction she could Maybe make it work. They don't do that. So this, they, so you're just uh, so basically, yeah. directors aren't being flexible enough. Exactly. Next, next, who's next? And so, this girl, who's just one of the most brilliant actresses I've ever worked with, is sort of stuck, uh, you know, trying to figure it out, like all of us are. They're not. They're not being like you said, thinky. Thinky. Yeah. 
they're, sure. they're being too, they're, they're being too thinky. Yeah, I, I love it when directors say, "Hey, Paul, that was really good. Can you try doing it again? Can you be less serious and this time, you know, or whatever the direction happens to be?" Because then you're going, "Yeah, sure, I can do that." I mean, actors are trained to do that. You have to be facile and change directions if a director asks you to do something. But a lot That's of times, positions they don't. You don't get asked that. That's one thing I like about working with like Ezra and our other other friend we're doing stuff for. They're they're actually very quite flexible with the with. They're actually quite flexible with how they do things. Like, I mean, Ezra, I can attest to Ezra being very flexible with the way our voices were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just go, going back to that the voice thing, and um, you know, them, and you doing all these takes. You know, I've heard people who have done, you know, two hundred takes of one line, one simple little line. Oh well, yeah. And yeah. then you know, if you're if you're if you're watching the episode uh, when it first airs. Or you know later on, and you're like, oh, they chose that take. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did, did that ever happen to you? <laughs> yeah, oh sure. And but sometimes they'll take half of one take and half of another one in oh, one yeah. line <laughs> and put it together. And and yeah, I've I've certainly done probably fifty or sixty readings of one line to try to get them what they want. But the problem is, after you've done about twenty, your brain starts to atrophy. <laughs> you're, you're, there's some part of you that goes, okay, what what can I do that I haven't done? Mm-hmm. What can I show them that I haven't done right now? I mean, I, I going back to 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 when I fir- first booked my first big commercial campaign with Shell Oil. Um, <clears throat> I got it, saying one line. The tagline for the for Shell Oil's campaign was Shell. Uh, the world's best-selling gasoline. That was it. Okay, and they said, "Yeah, we're pretty sure we want to use Paul, but we're going to schedule a session for him to come in and work with uh, the producers and the client." So I went into a studio, <clears throat> and I would say for an hour and a half, I said that one line over and over, <laughs> over, and over again. Oh, there's, only so many, there's only so many inflections you can put in a phrase like that. I wanted to kill myself. I just uh, was, oh my God. I, I just, Jesus, after a while, you're like, I love this campaign, guys, but I don't know what else I can possibly do to make this. I, here, and here's another one. <clears throat> I, I, I had the campaign for Amstel Light <clears throat> for a long time. Um, and the line for that was, um, <clears throat> Amstel Light, the world's best-selling light beer. So there was usually when you're dealing with multi-million dollar campaigns, there's a committee of people and they all have to sign off on something. So apparently in this case, there was one guy who said, yeah, I'm not sure about Paul. <clears throat> Why don't we do this? Let's him come in. <clears throat> and you know what? Because we're Dutch, a Dutch company, Let's explore the idea of having Paul do it in a South African accent. Oh, God. <laughs> Just that one guy. But you know, I like Paul, but do we really love Paul? Can he do what he's doing with a South African accent? So they hired, they hired a, an accent coach, and I went in <clears throat> to the studio and learned to speak South African. To, to, to South Africa, and I was doing this commercial with this guy, giving me the line readings over and over for about an hour and twenty minutes. Oh no! They finally bailed on the idea, and I ended up. Working on it. But it was like, are you? You have to sometimes jump through these hoops because they're spending millions and millions, and millions of dollars on this stuff, and, and they want to get it right. So that's how crazy it can get sometimes. But there, you, you, you have to be really patient, because there's times you just want to punch somebody. <clears throat> like, what am, what can I give you guys that you're not hearing? What do you want me to do? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I challenge anyone to say one line for an hour and a half and come up with 150 versions of it. Yeah, the, like the thing is, with so many people who aren't experienced in the business, uh, they they think you know you just go in like it's it's some easy job. You know, you go in and uh, you, you record your lines, and then you leave. It's only only takes like an hour, like thirty minutes maybe. But the th- thing is that it you take so you do so many takes, and if you know they say, oh, I want to be you know the main character in this cartoon series, mm-hmm. you're gonna go through <laughs> some kind of living hell there with your voice. Yeah. Yeah, you are. It can. It can end up being like that because they want to get it right, and they have a lot riding on it, so they're feeling a lot of pressure. 
And so they just transfer that right onto you. Again, it's really interesting. I wonder what <clears throat> what Mel Blanc went through. Yeah. Around to him. I wonder what that experience was like for him and uh, and and how they did things back then. I mean, I love the story of all those Warner Brother guys coming up with ideas for their cartoons out in the parking lot. <laughs> you know that story? <clears throat> They would go out and act out ideas in the parking right. lot of Brother Brothers to kind of so, yeah. <laughs> so they were running around, jumping over things and hitting each other with, with wood and, and God knows what else. You know, uh, this sounds awesome. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, but I, I wonder for Mel Blanc, who, who did pretty much all of their characters, think about that. Um, what kind of pressure he felt. I, I, oh, I'm sure, yeah. I, I know I remember him going on Johnny Carson and, Johnny Carson would say, okay, what would a pregnant yak sound like now? <laughs> <laughs> he would come up with Right then, he would just snap your fingers and come up with something that sounded like a pregnant yak. So that just told you how pregnant he was. So one plops like 50 little like, post it notes down on his, on, on his desk saying, okay, Mel, we got some ideas. <laughs> Work well, with it. Yeah. Come back. Yeah, I think he. I think I heard him say that. That I think Johnny Carson asked him one day. Said, "How many different distinct voices do you have?" And I think he said, "Somewhere in the area of 150." <laughs> so that's amazing. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. I don't know what was wrong with his throat, but I'm glad it was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, thank God for Mel Blanc. Right? Oh, certainly. Oh, and it's so, best. it's so fortunate that they got a guy like that. I mean, everyone in the world, and they found you know the guy that can do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I sort of remember how he just <clears throat> he wrote them a letter or something, or he came in one day and they listened to him. I, I don't know. I can't. Oh remember. yeah, here's here's what happened. Uh, there's this wonderful documentary if you haven't seen, it, Mr. Scheffler. It's a uh, man of a thousand uh, voices. Uh, it's really great. Wanted- I've heard, heard of it. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. I should watch it actually. Well, there's this bit in there. I'm he sorry. Who is it? He basically crashed a lot of auditions until they gave him a voice. <laughs> yeah, he walked up to the gate, and the guy wouldn't let him in. Uh, and then basically, until the guy actually died, then he was able to come in. Like, like, until, like for a year or so, he kept going up to the guy asking, hey, "You know, I can, you know, I can do voices. Let me come in. Let me show him what I guess." Like, oh no, you're not coming. And then again, eventually he dies, and then he's allowed to. <laughs> he's allowed to, to come in. You know, the rest is history. <laughs> Well, he must have known. He must have known the kind of ability that he had to be that persistent. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Because I believe it was like the one, like uh, I want to say he moved to, uh, he moved close to wherever the nearest studio was, and he just kind of he and his family were just kind of like stuck there for the longest time. Like his father, he lost the job, and they pretty much were kind of landlocked there, and just he kind of grew up there. He was always kind of just coming there day to day, trying to get the you know, get the job because I mean they they travel all this way and <laughs> can't go back now. Huh. The moral of Mel Blanc story is persistence pays off. Right, right. <laughs> and you know what's you know what's so great about Mel Blanc too is that uh, after he had his uh, really kind of death-defying a, a car accident when he was in the hospital, he's laid up getting better. Like uh, it's so respectable that out of, out of a show of respect, they wouldn't uh, they they held off on, on recording more episodes because they wanted him to come back to do it. Wow, wow. I know. And like the other actors, like they they'd be asked like. Uh, it was almost like a show of solidarity of like if they were asked to like do do the voice while Mel was gone, like have some of the other characters, like you know, very few and far between like I think Witch Hazel originally might have been someone. You know, like the, there was an Elmer Fudd who was different and Mel Blank eventually <laughs> took that role over, but you know, like that guy and other people were approached of like, Why don't you do the voice of uh, Bugs Money or like, you know, this character what we need for this character he says, No, no, we're not doing it without Mel, we're not gonna do that for it. and eventually they, they had no choice but to wait for him and it was awesome. Yeah. I marvel at the people. I mean, after Mel had gone and they were doing a Warner Brothers cartoons, that there were people who could come in and imitate the stuff that he did pretty well. You know, it wasn't him. You could tell it wasn't him, but you could. It just goes to show you how much <clears throat> voice talent there is out there that people can replicate the voice of characters that he's done and, and do a pretty respectable job of it. Yeah, I mean, the last, uh, last thing he ever did was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <clears throat> That's right. Wow. And speaking of speaking of voices, do you regularly take improv classes to improve your voice acting skills? Like you know, monthly, yearly, nothing. No, I really, I really don't. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I've been so busy acting, doing stuff that I just try to pull it out of my ear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I really don't. Um, it's an interesting idea, actually. Oh, actually, John, John was the one who just 
forced me to, I mean, he, when I say forced me, I mean, I was in a situation where he was giving me the opportunity to try so many different things that I would <clears throat> spend a lot of time on my own coming up with different voices, coming up with different characters. So I got a really good idea of what I was capable of. I mean, I, I guess if I, if I was doing animated stuff constantly, I, I would be constantly trying to tweak what it was that I, I was able to do to come up with different characters, but I guess I've been so busy as an actor doing other things that uh, I, I just haven't been going to class to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You go where the work is. You really do. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it's convenient for Curry for you that both Broadway and Courage were both in New York. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I was very lucky. It yeah. always really worked out that way. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you ever meet? I, I know you said earlier that you never recorded with any of the other uh, cast, but did you ever meet any of them? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I know. I knew a lot of. Uh, well, some of them were friends of mine who, who oh. you know, in the Broadway community and theater community. I mean, you, I mean, I know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, and I, I knew these people from doing the regular voiceover circuit or seeing them in shows because they're very talented actors. And so yeah, we would have. Um, I, I, we had a few cast parties, but we all got together and got to know each other. Yeah. Uh, what was your What was your first impression of Marty, Thea, and Lionel? <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or, 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 or maybe a better question would be: What was your first, um, I guess, reaction to the voices they they could they could pull off? Oh boy, that's an interesting question. It's funny you ask that because <clears throat> we were talking earlier about Archer, and. Um, Having listened to that series for like three seasons, you, you have a picture in your mind of what these people look like. And so when I IMDb'd them to take a look at what they actually looked like, they were so different. Oh, yeah. Especially <laughs> H.M. <Sean> Benjamin. <laughs> the same thing when I met all the people from Courage. Uh, you know, I expected the them to look like the characters they played, and of course they don't at all. So fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, but that's sort of an interesting goes to the point of you know if you're a producer or you like John or you some you have a picture in your head <clears throat> of <clears throat> what the voice match is for a character you're doing it could be completely different than the actual physical person themselves. Fascinating. Um, yeah, it's a very inaccurate, fascinating, creative science. And uh, so. Since Courage ended, after that ended, what was your, were you mixed, or did you have mixed feelings about the show ending? Oh, I was very sad that it ended. I mean, most things don't go longer than four seasons, but then yeah. for a while John was talking about there being interest in, um, in there being a film of Courage. Oh, like, I've never, oh, really, never heard about that before. <laughs> there was chit chat about that for a while, and then I yeah. guess the Cartoon Network came under new people who were yeah, yeah. and that they changed things and went in a new direction. So I was sad about it. I really was. I had such a great time doing it, uh, to be honest. So that's, was, something, that's, yeah. something even, that's not something even John mentioned. He never even mentioned that to us. No, he's never I don't I've never heard him mention that ever before. I mean I don't think that's on the record either. I, I guess well maybe before all the, the management people of Cartoon Network it all changed. Maybe there was some talk of it. Yeah, I think the, the, the closest thing he's ever said to that is, you know, he, he wanted to work with them on another show, but then, it, of course, it came under new, new management, and that just got cut off. I remember I came in, I, I went into audition for that. It was Chugs and Chugle or something. Yeah, That's yeah, the animatic, he posted that on his YouTube page. Yep, yep, yep. yep. I was, um, I went into audition for that. Um, th that was around the time that I also, they were going to do an, an animated series on PBS of Nate the Great. Um, <laughs> if you know that children's story, and I had one of the main, <laughs> this is sort of interesting, uh, I had uh, one of the main characters in that, um, and went in to record, God, um, they had done like, like 13 episodes of it, and I had done three or four of them, and then the producers and the writers had an enormous falling out, and they canceled the whole thing. Oh, <laughs> that's never good. No, I was really depressed about that. We all were. We were like, oh man. Anyway, well, what's well, the most? I'm sorry. Go on. 
Go ahead. No, go ahead. What's your question? Uh, I was, was going to ask you, what, what's the most challenging part of, of of finding a character? Like just when you're when you're searching for it, not not just animation, just in general, like when you're kind of either finding an existing part or just when you're coming up with something from scratch. What, what, uh, uh, I would say trying to have the common, trying to meet. If you have an idea of what a voice could be for a character, and you go in and they go, no, that's not at all how we see it. <laughs> <laughs> so the most challenging thing is to find that point where you meet, because uh, you have strong impulses when you be a character and you go, "Oh my God, this voice is going to be great. They're going to love this." And you come in and they go, "No, that's not how we envision it." So the toughest part is arriving at an agreed upon voice um, that everybody likes. <laughs> that's it. That's the hardest part. Once you've got that and you figured out what that voice is, then you can build on it from there. But until you arrive at that place it's it's really kind of hard because every you know everybody has a creative vision in their mind of what something is but they might be completely different and so you since the John's the creator of it you've got to find what that is and that's the hardest part compromise hmm the compromise uh, yeah, well, he, he's heard something in your voice that he likes, but there's so many variations on what you, hopefully, what you can do with your voice that it, 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 it's the cadence of it, it's the, 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 the tone of it, it's where it's pitched, it's how fast the character speaks or slowly, it's if he has any idiosyncrasies in his voice, like, you know, like the quack with a... <laughs> <laughs> you know, creating that, uh, whatever that was supposed to be, and that worked out <laughs> fine. But there have been other things, like the dead guy, that, uh, what what is dead <laughs> to you? Um, it's in, my, in your mind, you're going, well, I'm doing what they want, aren't I? And they're hearing something different that's not working for them. So that probably is the toughest thing for any uh, animated a voice actor trying to find and nail that voice that they want, and once you find it, being consistent with it. Hmm. I mean, the people who do stuff all the time who've done many, and they just wear those characters who probably are close to what their voice sounds like, like you know, an old pair of jeans because they're so familiar with it. But when you're creating something new and you don't know what that is, it's tough to find. Uh, Sometimes. Um, what what episode or characters do you feel you did your your best work on? Like, just you walked out of that, it's like, wow, I just I knocked it out of the ballpark. Or you saw the end result, and you were like, man, that that was just really stunning work. Freaky Freaky Fred was like that because it was such an out there character, and they weren't even sure about it because it was so dark, and it's just supposed to be a cartoon for kids. <laughs> that um, um, you know, it, it was very risky for them. That was the, probably one of the most risky dark or episodes they've ever done, but it was clear when we started it that we were, they were like, yeah, this, this is really working, and uh, what I was doing, and, and we all felt that, so it was a really good day, it was a really fun day, and I came in on that day in like really great voice, and just felt like I was clicking with whatever, whatever what we were doing, and so that was one of those days where everything was just working. Let me let me just pat you on the back for that one because you know why that's so intense and scary. It's it's not, it's it's because he's he's, he's cutting hair. He's not doing anything truly horrific, truly rude. I'll give you, but he's not doing anything truly horrific. But it's all the the performance that's really making it you know creepy and and, and disturbing and all the mo and all the kind of the great ways it ends up being. I think that's all in your performance there, sir. Oh, yeah, thanks, thank you. Yeah, it, and, and then what the character was and and. What, it was just like the voice and the character matched the, the visuals in, in a way that was really, I just read a lot of stuff online about people going, yep, that's one of the top five or 10 creepiest characters in the animated series. <laughs> no, yeah, I think Tiki can attest to that one. Yeah. And it, I, I, out, of, out of context, it, seem, it seems just goofy. Like he, what he is is basically just this, this psycho hair cutter. <laughs> yeah, this I psycho like barber. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I get hit it on the head. It's like it's the simplicity of the character mixed with just kind of the the very creepy rhyming structure that makes it work so well. Yeah, and probably that that episode was more for adults than it was for kids. Too. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I still loved it as a kid, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like such a wonderful way of getting getting away with that, but tailoring it for kids. So it's like it's cutting hair, but still you know the intentions of what it's really about. 
Right. right. Well, it's, almost, it's almost like a kid version of Sweeney Todd. <laughs> oh, God. Well, yeah, it's very much so. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I know. I mean, I, I mean, like a like Kinda I like Hannibal Lecter meets Sweeney Todd in a way. <laughs> like I said, I, like I said, I was just talking. I was talking to these guys about like how I was watching the rewatching the show in college, like in my in, in a dorm when I when I was in a dorm room with some of my roommates, and I was just like I I told them I was watching Curse the Cowardly Dog, and oh. I like I was like and they were like. Ooh, which one are you watching? I was like, naughty. <laughs> and, and they just instantly knew which one I was talking about. <laughs> so, so that's a, that's a great that's a testament to both the show and your and your work. <laughs> we we we, you know they well part of the fun was like that. How many different ways can you say that line? Um, we kind of laughed a lot in that episode. Everyone was just laughing, going, "This is so creepy." <laughs> 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 We're being very old here, you know. Um, really you, you, cool. you just needed to put some like black, like black eyeshadow on, and like get, like a, a razor, and just. <laughs> exactly. I, I was telling you, you're in there with a towel around your neck, and then sometimes you'd try to come in with with costumes or something else just to give you a, a leg up on the character. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, you know, for the quack, you know, you are twiddling your mustache when you. Oh yeah. You know what's <laughs> funny? For some bizarre reason, I don't know why. Uh, People, uh, I guess, have also like the Wikipedia page. They keep saying Tim Curry did the voice of Fred. <laughs> you <hear> that? <laughs> yes, it's, I'm serious. I was just I was looking up just to kind of make sure the episode because I for my my thought it was naughty. I forgot if it was actually called Freaky Fred because we always talk about Freaky Fred. And I looked at it. Oh my God! It's, <laughs> well, I think it's Tim that. Curry. I can see Tim Curry doing it. Sure. <clears throat> Absolutely. Some people, some people also said the same thing about the Goose God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he could. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, honestly, for the longest time, I thought he did do the Goose God. Right out of Rocky Horror or something, isn't it? I mean, geez. <laughs> and then, um, I think we're growing, growing close to the end here. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to wrap it up with a, a couple more questions here. Um, this, this question kind of ties into what uh, Dragon was asking. What is your favorite episode, if you had to choose one episode? I know you said you couldn't choose a favorite character, but can you choose a favorite episode from the series? I gotta go with Freaky Fred. I, I, <laughs> I love watching it. So I, I guess it's my favorite. I, I like turning it on every now and then and putting it on my stereo and going, "Oh my god, this is so creepy." <laughs> <laughs> another, episode, another episode that's basically a monologue of your voice. <laughs> Say again? Yeah, basically that's all it was, right? <clears throat> yeah. Other than uh, other than the occasional courage dialogue. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, think about hard that how hard that was. Marty to do that 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 dog character to come up with uh, so many different variations of the same thing. <laughs> you mean think about what <laughs> one of my you know, favorites is Courage and Fear episodes. Just one of my favorite other favorite episodes it has to be Heads of Beef, and it's the, all the different variations of the <laughs> dog reaction. Talk about somebody who was absolutely sweating. It must have been him. Um, I think about the guy who does um, Curious George. Who plays George the monkey? He's got a you know, without actually speaking, communicate so many different things with just sort of squeaks. It's, it's doesn't, Frank, doesn't Frank Welker do that? Uh, yeah. I wouldn't <clears> be <throat> surprised. Really, it's really good. He's really good because he creates so many different things without actually saying a word. Quite, quite, quite amazing. And then, um, Paul, did, of course, I, 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 I think it's safe to assume that um, John or someone would show you a sketch or a concept or of the character you were doing before you went in and did it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. He would give me a piece of paper and say, "Here's this character. Um, go oh, take it and go play with it. And when we get together in three days, we'll uh, see what you got." So I would have to go into my room and shut the door and 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 record myself doing stuff and going, "Yeah, that sounds right." So I would come up with maybe five or six ideas for a character and go from there. Uh, but it was it was fun and, and pressure because you want to get it right, but you don't know exactly what his vision is for what it sounds like. And that's going back to the part of what's tricky, but it was certainly a lot of fun. But yes, you would give me a, 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 a it's funny, I would, when I would go to the show, I would say, hey, these guys are giving me the character. I got to come up with the voice. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So, but it was fun. That's, I mean, you, that's how you learn. You learn on the fly. And um, that's how it was for me. 
figuring out as I went along, and it worked out. Wow. Well, do you guys have any other questions? Oh uh, yeah, like uh, maybe two more. Okay. Uh, do you have any regrets uh, uh, working on uh, Courage after after the fact? Like uh, anything you wish you had done, or had, had wish you gotten the chance to do? No, not really. I mean, they were so good to me. I, I, to be honest with you, I, I had so much fun. Um, I don't know how many episodes I did, but it was a lot. So I, I have nothing but gratitude to those guys. Yeah, I, I just think, miss, I I miss everybody because we had so much fun. Yeah, just lo looking at the animation, the voice acting, it sounds like you know everyone's just having a blast behind yep. the microphone there. <laughs> yeah, we basically were. It was a big silly party. A party of silliness, that's what we were doing. <laughs> a party of silliness to create, a, to create darkness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a dark, dark show for sure. Absolutely. All right. Uh, last one, and for me at least, and this is kind of, this is kind of twofold if you don't mind. Uh, do you have any advice uh, to, to others breaking into acting? If you could answer in the form of, of the snowman, that would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> breaking into acting? Yeah, for others to break into you know voice acting or just acting in the theater, which yeah, whichever. Well, I would say if you're a <clears throat> if you're going to break into acting, you should probably go to some classes and find out what uh, what you're capable of doing. That would be my first. I mean, everyone who wants to break into acting should probably go and take some classes and act like a child and see what what, the, what they can come up with that sort of thing to see if they have talent. And drink martinis. Um, to get into, <laughs> uh, getting into voice acting, I, I don't have. I, I I would have to say when I, when I tried to go the conventional route, I didn't get anywhere. But I happened to have a moment of hubris when I was in the agency to speak to one of the agents, and he happened to be the right person to speak to at the moment. So you know, sometimes it's just a little bit of luck, and things come together for you. So that's what happened to me. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, there's there's no one way to do it. I think you do have to just throw yourself out there. And I I, I, I still do. <clears throat> I still uh, have to throw myself out there. And it's like throwing seeds and you see what grows. But if you don't throw the seeds and get out and find out what you can do, you'll never know. Hmm. So, do, you, and do you think it's actually easy? Do you think it's easier or harder now that the Internet's already readily available for that kind of thing? Well, probably a bit of both. Probably easier because it's easier to get yourself out there. Probably harder because there's way more people doing it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's the Internet, uh, cyberspace has changed everything, I think, um, in ways <clears throat> that I don't, I'm not even sure of because there's, people have so many different ways to promote themselves and promote what they do. <clears throat> I mean, I have a website and I have stuff on it, and uh, but I see some of the things people do and it's quite remarkable. I mean, we've got LinkedIn, we've got Facebook, we've got our own web pages. You can promote yourself in so many different ways. And I, I don't know how people, you know, f figure out what's good and what's not because there must be an absolute avalanche of, of stuff out there to look at and to listen to um so if you have stuff that you've done it's helpful but <clears throat> if this is the way it's done then you have to go this route and see what lands that's some great advice mm -hmm. yeah. um and just one last little question here one last little request to wrap things up okay <laughs> could you do a little compilation of some of your characters from Courage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I have to look at my medical record before I can do it. Okay, first of all, um, I go in, I steal their valuables, and they won't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the welcome to the Cats Motel. I'm Cats. <laughs> um, it's Courage, the Curly Dog Show, starring Courage, the Curly Dog. <laughs> yeah, I can't sing. I've been singing for two hours today, so I don't have any high part of my voice right now. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. That's, that's, that's about all I have to remember, Money Fanny. Uh, I, <laughs> my eight-year-old has to get up early, and I have to get that to school. All right. so. yeah. Maybe you could finish off with doing uh, that dead guy's voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too bad now because it's very late, and if I don't, I'm not going to get up in time. 
<laughs> I wasn't being entirely serious, but thank you so much. Paul, where can people find you on social media these days? Uh, well, I go to my website. Um, that would be the best place, and they can contact me through that uh, or LinkedIn on Facebook. They can contact me that way, too. Okay. Well, Everyone give it up for the wonderful Paul Scheffler. Woo! Yeah. And yeah. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. What was that? What's the name of your website? PaulScheffler.net. All right. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure having you on. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. You. you too. Bye. 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 See ya. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, well, everyone, that just about wraps up our podcast for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we, I encourage you to, to subscribe for more great interviews and podcasts like these. I'll see you guys later.